Shakespeare and all the boys to the yard and they're like, oh, this thing's gross. There is a reason I'm wearing this terribleness. Just, just so you know. All will become clear later on. <laughs> Fifty years ago, if you wanted to wear something purple, you either had to sell everything you owned or be fortunate enough to be born a member of a royal family. Purple was literally worth more than its weight in gold, which to us now sounds completely mental, right? If you looked back at the 1800s, it'd probably look a little bit like all the photos we have left over today, bland and grey. That's because colour was really hard to make. A lot of the textile industry relied on organic dyes that were generally pretty hard to source. And some colours were easier to find than others. Purple was one of the hardest to find. Now, if you were a snail living off the coast of the Mediterranean near ancient Phoenicia, you were pretty much guaranteed to have a bad time. You see, there was this one particular species of snail that if you boiled it down into a mush, it produced this vivid purple colour. It was called Tyrian purple after the city of Tyre, where this colour generally came from. The only problem was you needed a hell of a lot of these snails to make any sort of purple dye worth using. You needed about 9,000 of these teeny tiny little snails to make one gram of Tyrian Tyrian purple. Yeah, I keep saying Tyrian. It's not Tyrian purple. I've got Game of Thrones on the brain. Is there nothing I can do to remedy this? Tyrian purple. Tyrian purple. Okay. Hence it cost more than what you'd make in a lifetime, actually what most people would make in a lifetime, to buy anything purple at all. It's actually now why we associate the colour purple with royalty, because they were literally the only ones who could even remotely afford to buy anything. Speaking of expensive, back in the 1800s, the British were sort of getting all colonial. Okay, can I stop wearing this now? Is that a thing? Oh, yeah, I'm gonna take it off. Oh. Oh. That's better. I'll wear your grandma's clothes. I look incredible. With expansion into the new world came new and interesting diseases. One such new and interesting disease was a mosquito-borne illness called malaria. It was sort of wreaking havoc on the population and the only cure that had been found up to that point was this thing called quinine. Now quinine, not unlike Tyrian purple, could only be sourced naturally. It only grew in these little flowering plants in South America. So chemists back in England were trying furiously to find a way to synthesize it in a lab. Chemistry as a scientific discipline was pretty new to the scene and they'd only really recently stopped being all about how to turn lead into gold. The science was still a little bit of a mix of knowledge and educated guess. Enter the first director of the Royal College of Chemistry in London, August Wilhelm von Hoffmann. Hoffmann was convinced that he could make quinine in a laboratory and so, like all good professors, he turned to his young protege and offloaded all of the work. William Perkin was a chemical whiz kid. By the age of 18, he had an entire chemical laboratory set up in his apartment in London, just casually. There's my lounge room, there's the kitchen, there's my chemical laboratory, there's my bathroom. <laughs> and it was here that he started playing around with quinine and coal tar, like a lump of coal, coal tar. It was something that was just in abundance because of the industrial revolution and it was filled with all of these organic compounds that chemists were playing around with. So he mixed a bunch of things together and boom, he created a black mess in the bottom of a beaker. <laughs> Now, when you make a mistake like that, you kind of have to clean everything up and start again, right? Unfortunately, most organic compounds don't mix very well with water, so you have to use a, some form of alcohol or acetone or something like that to get rid of all of the goo inside of your beakers so you can reuse them. So Perkin added alcohol to start again to wash everything up and stop. Because in the bottom of his beaker, there was purple. There was just a purple mass of purple in his beaker. The cogs in Perkins' genius mind started whirring furiously. Could he make that again? Yes, because like all good scientists, he kept really, really up-to-date and comprehensive laboratory notes. I am looking at you, past Joe. Writing a thesis is helped by good laboratory notes. Just saying. So he did it again, and again, and again, until finally he locked in a process to make a chemical compound he called Movine. He put it to the test with a piece of silk and found that the colour stayed. It stuck. He had a purple piece of silk. He took it to a textile manufacturer and the rest is history. He single-handedly created the synthetic dye industry. A mixture of luck and skill catapulted William Perkin towards a ridiculous amount of wealth and fame. Plus, when the Queen of England and the Emperor of France start wearing your clothing, you know you're going to have a good time. The ingredients for the dye were also ridiculously cheap. I mean, coal tar was abundant. You could find it all over the place in the Industrial Revolution. 
revolution. Perkin went on to develop a whole bunch of other different synthetic dyes, presumably in his apartment with his chemical laboratory just casually in a corner. William Perkin changed the way our world looked. We have colour everywhere, mostly thanks to a happy accident. Perkin died a member of the Royal Society in London, a ridiculously wealthy man, a knight of the realm, and presumably the saviour of the snails in Lebanon. <laughs> If you enjoyed the story, there are plenty more where that came from. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. You can also follow me on Facebook and on Twitter where you can make suggestions, you can ask me questions, and I also post a bunch of links to extra content and extra reading if you're interested. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next week. I want a chemical laboratory in my house. I think that'd be really cool. I think it'd be dangerous, but I think it'd be really cool. I mean, I'd have to have some sort of hand washing station and like access to some sort of minus 80 degree freezer just because I love minus 80 degree freezers. I got to play with one earlier, it was just awesome. Things just go <laughs> snap frozen, it's wonderful. Liquid nitrogen, <gasps> oh! Liquid nitrogen in my house. Oh, so dangerous, but so fun. Mm. Yeah, I want a chemical laboratory in my house. I'm gonna pull a William Perkin. <laughs>